Welcome back, guys. It's lesson 37. We're discussing quantum teleportation, or at least that's the punchline. We actually have a lot of things to talk about today. The first is the remaining schedule for the semester. I wanted to remind you that on lesson 39, we're going to be taking the QMAT. It's sort of a diagnostic exam about quantum mechanical concepts, and that should help us uh, get ready for the final exam. We're going to be talking about the final graded review, uh, the themes that will be assessed in the final exam and so that'll take a little bit of time and finally we're going to end it up with the discussion of teleportation we're going to need to hit a couple of concepts before that but uh, mostly that's what we're going to be doing so let's talk about the themes for the for the final we're going to need to understand wave functions probability distributions time independent Schrodinger equation solutions the concept of commutation and the impact it has on our interpretation of uh, the wave function and various observables. The notion of time evolution of quantum states. We've, this has been a major theme for the entire semester, so I hope everybody can basically nail the time evolution aspect. And finally, we're going to focus a little bit on measurement. How measurement works, what does it mean, how do different observables behave when you measure various other observables, and so on. And finally, we're going to uh, have a section on the 3D quantum wave functions, angular momentum, spin, and all that stuff. So let's uh, let's start talking about measurement for a given observer, for a given observable. Excuse me. What values are possible? The answer is the eigenvalues of the operator that represents that observable are the only things you'll ever measure for that observable. Um, what probability? With what probability will you measure these observables? The answer is at any given moment, the probability of measuring any particular eigenvalue is the amplitude of that eigenvector in the overall quantum state. So you project out the eigenvector of that observable <coughs> that corresponds to a particular eigenvalue, and the amplitude of that projection is going to be the uh, going to determine the probability. The probability, of course, is the amplitude squared. And uh, finally, after the measurement is complete, what state will the system be in? And the answer is it will be in the eigenstate that corresponds to the eigenvector that corresponds to the eigenvalue that was actually measured. At least that's the interpretation we're going with in this course. There's a lot of different people who have different ideas about how measurement actually works and what it all means, but this is the most straightforward traditional interpretation of how measurement goes. The idea of wave functions. First, uh, boundary conditions. You need to understand that if you have finite potentials everywhere, th that the wave function has to be both continuous and its first derivative has to be continuous everywhere. In particular, if you have a finite potential that changes values, it, the wave function has to remain continuous and its derivative has to remain continuous whenever the potential changes. Um, the boundary conditions often lead to particular energies that correspond to eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and also the notion that a generic quantum state is made up of, of a superposition of eigenvectors and uh, that that's often looked at in, with wave functions as a kind of a Fourier series, a superposition of different eigenfunctions in that case. The idea of probability distribution, the notion of normalization, the idea that uh, that the total probability of being anything has to be one, no matter what the state is. Uh, the, the idea of expectation values, so you uh, need to be able to compute various expectation values, position, momentum, energy, angular momentum, and so on. Uh, the different kinds of probability distributions we have, discrete and continuous, and uh, probability distributions that extend into more than one dimension, one, two, and three-dimensional probability density functions. Okay, so what about the time-independent Schrodinger equation? You need to be able to sketch solutions uh, to the Schrodinger equation with various potentials, understand the difference between discrete and continuous spectra, the way kinetic energy leads to curvature, or uh, the way when the potential is greater than the energy, you get these uh, real exponential solutions and how the curvature of those solutions depends on uh, how far the energy, how far the energy is below the potential energy, and also the concept of energy eigenvalues. 
uh, the whole notion of separation of variables and how the eigenvalues come about in three dimensions due to the separation of the various spatial uh, coordinates in the system. And uh, finally, of course, all those one-dimensional systems we studied and the uh, higher dimensional systems we studied in, uh, in chapter four. So we've got the infinite square well, the simple harmonic oscillator, the finite square well, barriers, scattering, and so on. Uh, all that stuff. The concept of commutation, the idea that uh, observables that don't commute with one another are incompatible. Observables that do commute with one another are compatible. And what that means about the eigenvectors that we use to represent these observables, eigenvectors of definite value of these observables. Um, the notion that when the an observable commutes with the Hamiltonian, then its uh, expectation value is independent of time and also that the eigenvectors of that observable um, will uh, conform a, a set of eigenvectors. A, a, how would you call it? You can have a common set of eigenvectors of operators that commute with the Hamiltonian and the uh, energy eigenvectors. And that means that uh, basically if you have an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian, its observables don't, it's, uh, the, the, oh golly, I can't even speak. The value of that observable doesn't depend on time. That's the idea. Um, ha having said that, the rate at which an observable changes in time depends on its commutator with the Hamiltonian. And actually, we'll get to that today. And finally, the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are special. If you're in a Hamiltonian eigenstate, it's called a stationary state. And uh, a pure stationary state, of course, no observable is going to uh, depend on time with that one. The expectation value of any observable will not depend on time in an energy eigenstate. Okay, so uh, how does time evolution work? Of course, you need to know the time evolution operator, and you need the special significance that energy eigenstates have in terms of time evolution. The Fourier expansion in the energy basis is what gives us an easy way to apply the time evolution operator. And, uh, and the notion that other observables, uh, when you have a superposition of different energy eigenstates, they tend to slosh. And so what happens to other observables in, in, th in that case? So, uh, okay. So we also have this idea of higher dimensional systems and angular momentum and spin. And so the infinite square well in two and three dimensions, the, the spherical square well, and of course the hydrogen atom. And all the stuff that came along with those spherically symmetric potentials, orbital angular momentum, spin, and so forth. Okay, so that's a brief review of the topics that are going to be on the, uh, on the final exam. Let's talk a little bit about the time dependence of an observable. Let's say we have an observable that uh, we want to know what its expectation value does in time. Now, of course, the expectation value of an observable is the inner product of the wave function with what you get when you apply the operator to the wave function. And if you look at the product, if you look at that inner product, you'll notice it has three pieces. It's got the bra, it's got the operator, and it's got the ket. And in principle, all three of those things can depend on time. We're going to focus on those cases where the operator doesn't explicitly depend on time. In other words, there's no t in the operator itself. All the operators we deal with in this course uh, have that property, that there's no t actually embedded in the operator. And, and also remember that when the Hamiltonian hits the wave function, that produces something proportional to the time rate of change. And so what you can do is uh, solve for psi dot, and you can see that that's minus i Hamiltonian divided by h bar. And uh, we can use that to evaluate this thing. So psi dot is minus i Hamiltonian over h bar. I can plug that in. Uh, the bra, of course, the i becomes plus i instead of minus i. And so you plug all that in and notice <coughs> that what you get there is the Hamiltonian hitting the operator minus the operator hitting the Hamiltonian. But that's nothing other than the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the operator. So this final result is quite simple that the time rate of change of the expectation value of an operator 
is proportional to the commutator of the operator with the Hamiltonian. So um, that says that if an operator commutes with the Hamiltonian, that its time rate of change is zero. And if it doesn't commute with the Hamiltonian, then it does have a time rate of change. That's the idea. So um, also, we're going to be talking about teleportation in a moment. And I just wanted to point out that there's a theorem. You know, one, one issue is, uh, well, heck, why would I need to teleport if I could just clone? Maybe I could clone a quantum state and then just carry it wherever I wanted to. And I'd have a copy of the quantum state wherever I wanted it. But there's this thing called the no cloning theorem. Let's see how it works. Remember how a linear operator operates. If you apply an operator to a superposition, it's the same as distributing the operator over the superposition and applying it to each of the individual states within the superposition. This is a property that all quantum mechanical operators possess. They are linear operators. And so if you imagine the possibility, let's just think of the theoretical possibility, that someone could invent a cloning operator, an operator that took a state of two particles, say, one in state phi and one in state psi, and it could somehow operate in such a way that when it was finished, you got two particles in the same state, phi. So this would effectively clone the quantum state phi and, uh, and force the second particle into that state. Is it possible we could invent such a thing? Let's take a concrete example. Let's say we have a particle that's spin up and another particle that it's in some arbitrary state. And we could imagine an operator that if it, uh, if it applied to the first state, if it applied to that in initial state, it would produce as an output a state where both particles were spin up, regardless of the condition of the first of the second particle initially. So it would it would wipe out the information associated with that particle initially, and produce a particle that was spin up regardless. Similarly, if you had started with the first particle spin down and you applied this theoretical cloning operator, you'd end up with two spin down particles. Well, the question then is, what happens if you put in a particle that's got its spin oriented in some other direction? Say, for example, the x direction. So the plus x direction, remember, that's spin up plus spin down over the square root of 2. What would happen to the cloning if we cloned this state? Um, what would we get? Well, remember that the cloning operator um, operates is a linear operator. So if you apply it to a superposition state, that's the same thing as applying it to the first state plus applying it to the second state. So we haven't actually changed anything. We should be able to apply it in this way. And of course, that is going to turn out to be up, up, plus down, down. But that state is not the same as the state x plus x plus, which is the state we were trying to achieve by cloning the x plus state. Let's see why that is. x plus x plus would look like this. It's up plus down over the square root of 2 and up plus down over the square root of 2 for the two particles. But if I multiply that out, it actually looks like this. It's up, up, plus up, down, plus down, up, plus down, down. And it's divided by 2. But the state we got was up, up, plus down, down. We're missing the up, down, and down, up states in our cloned state. So what that means is the cloning operator can't work. It could work in principle for cloning the two particular states up and down, but it can't clone an arbitrary state. Uh, the linear operator machinery just won't permit that. So what that means is, you, you've heard no can do. Well, the moral of this one is no can clone. Too bad. All right. Okay, well, oh, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about. It's the notion of a special class of unitary transformations that we're going to need in order to do the teleportation. Um, first, we need a mathematical theorem, which I'm just going to propose. We can talk about it in class and prove it if you're interested. But basically, the theorem goes like this. e to the i alpha times a sigma matrix, where the sigma matrices are the, the Pauli matrices, uh, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. They're a special class of matrices. But uh, the idea is that if you um, if you calculate e to the i alpha sigma j, what you get is cosine alpha times the identity plus i times the sine of alpha times the sigma j that you use. You can use any of the three sigma j's and, and this thing will work. The, uh, 
The point is that we can use this to, to build up essentially arbitrary transformations of spin one-half particles. So let's, let's see how this works. Imagine we have a spin one-half particle in a magnetic field. Uh, we did this last week uh, on the board, essentially. And uh, the Hamiltonian is going to be minus b dot mu, but mu, of course, is gamma times s, the spin of the particle. And so if we put that Hamiltonian in and create a time evolution operator out of that Hamiltonian, um, what's the time evolution operator going to look like? It's going to be uh, e to the i gamma beta 0 over 2 sigma z if the magnetic field's pointing in the z direction. Of course, if you had it in the x direction, you'd get a sigma x. If you had it in the y direction, you'd get a sigma y. But uh, we'll just work with sigma z for the moment. I want you to notice that this is exactly the same operator in the theorem, except that uh, the angle alpha is now gamma b0 t over 2. Okay, so we'll uh, plug all that in. That means that the time evolution operator reduces to this thing. It's a cosine of something times the identity plus i times the sine of something times sigma z. If I uh, continue to, to push on this a little bit, we can put in what sigma z actually is, and you can see that the time evolution operator becomes exactly what you'd expect it to be, um, except that uh, if you apply it to an arbitrary state, you get that the upspin gets multiplied by e to the plus gamma beta 0 t over 2. The down state gets multiplied by e to the minus gamma beta i gamma b0 t over 2. Uh, you can multiply through by the phase factor uh, e to the minus i gamma b0 t over 2 in order to make that first term real. And you'll see that what's happening is that uh, your generic state just gets its phi direction changed by an, a certain amount, and uh, that means that it, since the general state is written with just a f e to the i phi on the down spin, that the phi coordinate simply spins around the z-axis. This is just Larmor precession, which we've already discussed. <coughs> so I just wanted to point out you're familiar with this in one context, but if you happen to apply the uh, magnetic field for a period of time such that gamma beta 0 t is equal to pi, notice that the cosine term goes away completely and that the sine becomes 1 and the time evolution operator for that short period of time becomes simply proportional to the uh, sigma operator. So what that means is you can physically realize uh, you can physically realize a situation in which the quantum state simply gets multiplied by a sigma operator um, by pointing a magnetic field in a particular direction and then just waiting for the appropriate amount of time. That's the idea. We're going to need this in just a little bit when we uh, finish the teleportation process. Okay, so here's the idea. We've got these things called Bell states. And there are four of them. There's two of them where the spins are different, and there's two of them where the spins are the same. But you'll notice that they're completely entangled states, where the two particles are entangled with one another. Neither of them has a definite spin. But if you measure the spin of one of them, it immediately affects the spin of the other. So, for example, in the different states, if you measure the spin of one um, to be up, the spin of the other be is definitely down. And in the same states, if you measure the spin of one, the other is the same direction of spin. So um, those are the so-called Bell states. I want to imagine we have two physicists, Alice and Bob, who are interested in teleporting a quantum state. Alice has a particle in the state phi. She has electron number one, and it's in the state phi where a and b are arbitrary complex numbers. Um, you could say that it's got a definite theta and a definite phi, um, but it's just a spin that points in some arbitrary direction. Okay. Now, in addition to that, Alice also has two electrons, electron 2 and electron 3, that are in a singlet 
state, so they're in the Bell state D minus with each other, and uh, and she's prepared these in advance. Now the basic plan is she's going to do a measurement on electrons one and two that will entangle them and detangle electron three. But before she does the experiment, she's going to carefully transport electron three or send it somehow to Bob. Or maybe Bob will come by someday and he'll pick up electron three, still entangled with electron two, and take it off with him someplace else in the world, to Switzerland or something. So Bob's got electron three, Alice has electron two, they are entangled with each other in a singlet state. And she also has this other electron, electron one, that's in a quantum state that she doesn't know what A and B are. She doesn't know what A and B are, but she wants that information about A and B to be teleported somehow magically to Bob. So the idea is um, the quantum state of electron one, two, and three is this product state, phi two, three, and uh, we can multiply all that out to figure out the complete state of the entire system. Electron one, electron two, and electron three are in this state. I'll call that state one, two, three. So Alice sends electron three to Bob, or Bob takes electron three with him. And then Alice measures the one, two system in the Bell basis. In other words, she has a machinery, some machinery, where she can send electrons one and two through the machinery and out will come the answer d plus, d minus, s plus, or s minus. Notice that those four states span the entire possible spectrum of states that one and two can have, so the combination of those particles has to be in one of those four states. Let's suppose, for example, she discovers that, that uh, her pair of electrons, one and two, are in the Bell state d minus. D minus is this state, so she needs to calculate the inner product of D minus of particles one and two on the overall state. So we have the overall state here. It's the state one, two, three. She takes the inner product of D minus with that state. Well, D minus, notice it has electron one up and electron two down. So one question is, what's that inner product? Well, you can see that that inner product comes from only one term in the overall state, because there's only one term that has electron one up and electron two down. And so <coughs> the answer is quite easy. It's got to be minus a over the square root of three, or the square root of two. But there comes along for the ride the fact that if she measures that state, that puts electron three up. She also needs to calculate the inner product of electron one down, electron two up, that inner product, as you can see, is plus b over the square root of 2, but it has electron 3 pointing down. If you calculate the overall inner product of d minus, then you get minus a half times the state a with electron 3 up plus b with electron 3 down. That's the overall amplitude of her getting the d minus result for electrons 1 and 2. Um, what I want to point out is that the part that has electron 3 in it is exactly the state phi. So when she makes this measurement, miraculously, Bob's electron will suddenly be in the state phi, which she had at the outset. Now the one half out in front simply corresponds to the fact that there are four Bell states and the probability of her measuring state d minus is one quarter. So you'd expect there to be an o a factor in the amplitude of uh, one half overall. Now, so now, what if instead of d minus, she had measured d plus? Now, d plus is the state um, one up, two down, plus one down, two up over the square root of two. Notice there's a plus instead of a minus. So this is not a singlet state. This is a, a s equals one m equals zero state, but um, I want to point out that uh, if she took this inner product, that the first electron, and with the first electron up, second electron down, would still only have an inner product with the third, or the second term, and the second part of d plus would only have an inner product with the third term, and when the smoke clears and you calculate everything, you get this as the inner product 
of d plus on one, two, three. So if she measures d plus, Bob's electron suddenly comes to a state, but it's not the state phi. It's the state a three up minus b three down. So in order to recover the state phi, Bob's gonna have to do some work. In fact, what he's gonna have to do is to multiply by sigma z. Notice, what does sigma z do? Sigma z uh, multiplies the up component by one and the down component by minus one. So in order for him to know that that's what he's got to do, Alice is gonna have to communicate with him. She's gonna have to ring him up on the phone and say, hey Bob, I measured D plus. That means you've got to run this system through a sigma z operator in order to make that happen. Of course, we just noticed that theorem that we showed a little bit earlier, showed that all he has to do then is to put the spin in a magnetic field pointing in the z direction for a period of time so that the identity part of the time evolution operator became zero and the uh, non-identity part, the sign term, uh, became proportional to sigma z. That would have the effect of leaving a alone but multiplying b by minus one. Basically the phi in the spin would have to zip around to uh, um, to become a minus one. That's the idea. So, um, things to notice. In order to complete teleportation, Bob may have to perform a linear transformation on the resulting state. Uh, you can apl like um, apply in a magnetic field for a short period of time. The original state that Alice had is gone. In the process of entangling, in the process of measuring uh, particles one and two together, she entangles particles one and two into a bell state, and in the process, she loses all information about what state particle one was in originally. The particle one state is gone, but it has magically reappeared in Bob's laboratory. And finally, it's necessary that Alice communicate with Bob in order to alert him to the fact that she measured one of the four bell states. He needs to know which of the four bell states the thing was in in Alice's lab in order to know what to do to the quantum state in his lab in order to get it to become the clone, or the uh, teleported version, I should say, of Alice's original state. Okay, so that's the way it works. Um, for the pre-flight today, I'm gonna ask you to figure out what Bob would have to do if one of the other bell states was discovered to be the correct one. And uh, that's kind of an interesting exercise and hope you guys enjoy it. I'll talk to you soon.